Philip Martin completed his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 1975. He spent his academic career at the University of California at Davis where he concentrated on migration issues. His specialty has been labor migration, particularly concerning farm workers in the United States, but he also has worked on projects assessing labor migration in Turkey and in Thailand. He retired from UC Davis and is now an emeritus professor there. Elizabeth Midgley has co-authored a number of studies related to international migration, starting with her coverage of immigration issues as a producer for CBS News from 1970 to 1988. She also is active in various organizations in Washington, D.C., including the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the Friends of the German Historical Society, and as president of the Working English Foundation to help U.S. immigrants learn the English language. Michael Teitelbaum attended Reed College as an undergraduate and then earned a 1970 doctorate in demography from Oxford University. Between 1969 and 1973, he was a research associate in the Office of Population Research at Princeton University, and from 1974 to 1978, he served as university lecturer in demography and faculty fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford University. He joined the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation as a program director and became vice president in 2007. He's retired and now works as a senior research associate at the Labor and Work Life Program of Harvard Law School. A particular idea about international migration that has cropped up time and again in the minds of government officials concerned with encouraging economic development. This idea has appeared in many different countries, but we focus here on Turkey in particular as one example of this idea to see how it worked out for them. In fact, the results we observe in Turkey also tend to appear over and over again in other places, so this is a useful investigation. The essence of the idea is that maybe it could be a good idea for a country to encourage some of its working age population to leave the country for a while, to go and work in some other country or countries, and then maybe to come back again later. Now, if you look at this from the point of view of dependency ratios, thinking about the fact that the working age population is the source of support for intergenerational transfers to young children and elderly dependents, the whole idea of losing part of that working age population might actually sound a little crazy and backwards. But if you look more closely at that working age population, you might find that not all of them are actually working, that some of them also depend on various kinds of transfers of resources from the actual working population. So maybe the idea is not completely crazy after all. We will see. In Turkey, the overarching goal of economic and foreign policy for at least the last 50 years has been to climb aboard the express train of the European Union. Turkey would desperately like to be included in the European common market, to adopt the euro as its currency, to dismantle all tariffs and other barriers to free trade and the free movement of capital, to encourage investments in the Turkish economy by entrepreneurs from Germany, France, Italy, and other European countries. The image of a man running after a streetcar comes to mind. Turkey is the running man and the European Union is the streetcar. But so far, this dream of the Turkish leaders has not come to pass. The EU remains nervous about letting Turkey into the club. Officially, the Eurocrats in Brussels complain that Turkey still does not have a good enough record on human rights and that many of its laws have not yet been harmonized with the standards adopted by European Union member states. But under the surface, one of the unspoken concerns of the Europeans also has been that EU member states allow free movements across their borders, not only of capital investments, goods and services, but also people. You can take a train from Madrid to Berlin today and never take out your passport. You hardly know when the train crosses a border. The Europeans are worried, quite simply, that these trains might fill up with millions and millions of people from Turkey emerging from the central train stations in all their cities looking for the European dream. The Turkish leaders themselves have been looking for the same European dream, and this is where the idea comes in of exporting some of your working age population. What could Turkey possibly gain by sending away some of its people during the prime of their working lives? The answer, at least hypothetically, offers several possibilities. 
First of all, if these people get good jobs in some other country where the economy is already developed to a higher level, they will start making good incomes. For example, maybe Turkish workers could go to Germany and work in automobile factories or on the railroads and other kinds of advanced industries. Since these workers would have families still living back in Turkey, they would, of course, send back some of the money to their relatives. All that extra money injected into the Turkish economy could serve as a lubricant to encourage economic growth and development at home. So the Turkish leaders had visions of these remittances of foreign capital dancing in their eyes. Also, particularly if you could send these workers to Germany, where the system of technical training and apprenticeships is the best and most advanced on the planet, they would learn all kinds of new skills. If they then moved back to Turkey, the level of human capital in the labor force would be improved, and this should make both new and existing Turkish industries more productive and profitable. So the Turkish leaders also dreamed of all these skilled workers coming home to boost domestic production. On the other side of the coin, of course, they also recognized that the Turkish economy wasn't all that great in the second half of the 20th century, and that a lot of people, particularly in the more rural, less developed eastern regions of the country, were either unemployed or underemployed. They couldn't find jobs in Turkey, so if they could be exported to work somewhere else, like Germany, this would reduce the unemployment problem and leave more of the government's resources for helping other people, like children and the elderly. And finally, if you could encourage some of the more troublesome political characters in your country to ride along on these same trains into Europe, you might also rid yourself of some of the irritations of trying to govern the country the way you wanted it to go. So actually, there were quite a few reasons, at least on paper, why Turkey might want to encourage people to take off to Germany or someplace for a few years. Philip Martin and his colleagues compare this migration from Turkey into Western Europe to what they see as another migration stream that is similar in at least some respects, the migration from Mexico into the United States. The parallels include the basic fact that these migration streams both run from a less economically developed country to more developed countries, and also the fact that at least in its early stages, these movements were encouraged by the sending country based on the idea that we started out with that such labor migration could actually be a tool of development policy in its own right. Another similarity can be found in that most of the working age people who took part in such migrations, both from Mexico and from Turkey, were coming from the relatively poorer rural and more backwards parts of each sending country. In both cases, this meant that the country that received these migrants got a mistaken impression about the sending country. The American stereotype of Mexicans usually does not focus on the fact that the richest man in the world lives in Mexico. And the German stereotypes of Turks is based mostly on experiences with people from the rural, agricultural, eastern part of the country, often part of the Kurdish minority there. But the migration from Turkey to Germany also shows some clear contrasts with the migration from Mexico to the United States. Martin and his colleagues point out that the stream of Mexican immigrants into the United States may have made it easier to pass NAFTA free trade legislation on the grounds that free trade would stimulate growth in Mexico and reduce the need for Mexican workers to move north. In contrast, the flow of Turkish workers into Europe already slowed down drastically in the last quarter of the 20th century. And in fact, one of the reasons why the EU has been dragging its feet on Turkish memberships is precisely the opposite fear, that free trade also means free movement of workers and that the flow of Turkish labor into Europe might start up again if Turkey were admitted. This opposite reasoning in the Turkish case also stems in part from the difference between NAFTA and EU regulations about labor. Once you get inside the walls of the European community, workers have more rights and governments have more responsibilities than are shared by signatories to the NAFTA agreement. The EU guarantees freedom of movement for all citizens of all member states, as well as for goods and services. NAFTA has no such provision. If you do move freely from one EU country to another, you carry with you all the protections afforded to all workers by EU laws and regulations. These include rights concerning working conditions, health and retirement, and freedom from discrimination that also differ from the provisions of NAFTA. So the analogy between Mexicans going to the United States and Turks going to Germany is only a very imprecise one. 
All of these features of the Turkish European case might convince you, as they did the leaders of Turkey, that it would be worthwhile to encourage labor migration out of the country. Like the Turkish leaders, you might decide to set up a whole organized government program to recruit workers, especially from the more impoverished backwards parts of the country, to help them with advice and pay for their train tickets, to negotiate with the German government and other countries to help them find jobs at the end of the train ride, and to wave at them as the trains and buses pulled out of the stations, carrying millions of Turkish workers off to new lives in new countries far away. At the same time, the German economy was booming as the country recovered from the devastation of World War II, and the rapid growth of the economy produced a strong demand for labor that could not be met by the German labor force. There, as in post-war America, a small generation of wartime births was coming of age just when they needed more and more workers. In Germany, the situation was even tighter because such an enormous fraction of the male population in the prime working ages had been blasted off the map fighting in German armies from North Africa to the Normandy beaches, from frozen Finland to the Russian oil fields on the shores of the Black Sea. Germany was not only recruiting workers from Turkey in those days, but also from Greece, Italy, Spain, and many other countries. The stage was set for a classic economic experiment. Out with the subject of labor emigration out of Turkey, Martin and his co-authors are not content to leave that as their only focus. One of the reasons they decided to look at Turkey in particular is that Turkey is not only a country that happened to try out the peculiar idea of exporting part of its labor force as a development strategy. The Anatolian plateau that forms the heart of modern-day Turkey also forms a land bridge connecting three of the most populated continents on the globe, Europe, Asia, and Africa. For thousands and thousands of years, population movements have crossed back and forth through the territory of today's Turkey, on their way to bring silks and spices from East Asia into Europe, or to carry wars of conquest in one direction or another. Century after century, new populations have wandered or marched into and out of this crossroads until today the ethnic makeup of the Turkish population itself contains historic remnants testifying to this ages-old interchange of peoples crossing between the continents. Each group bears witness to some kind of previous migration and settlement pattern all overlaid on top of one another. So the migrations that we observe today are just the most recent example of a dynamic in the distribution of the human race that has probably been going on for as long as we have walked the earth. The fact that we do walk the earth means that migration has always been with us and probably always will remain. So the migration from Turkey into Western Europe is only one panel of the triptych being constructed by Martin, Midgley, and Teitelbaum. This e-migration side of the balance has produced about 3 million Turks who left their country and took up residence in new lands, found new jobs, and in many cases found new homes where they have stayed, eventually with their families and children. Families and children. Where did they go? The answer is unmistakable. Over half of all Turkish citizens living outside Turkey today are to be found living in Germany. This reflects the deliberate efforts of the governments of both Germany, where these workers were desperately needed in the post-war rebirth of the German economy, and Turkey, where, as we have seen, the leaders perceived this exporting of part of the labor force as a development strategy with many possible payoffs. All the other destinations in the world don't add up to the Turkish population in Germany. This emigration out of Turkey also must be clearly understood as one particular type of migration. It involved what we commonly call labor migration, that is, people moving for one main reason, jobs. This is the type of migration, for example, that most clearly produces the characteristic age structure that we have come to think of for migrant populations, concentrated in the young working ages and tapering off to insignificance at both young and older dependent ages. There are other types of migration, of course. This example of labor migration from Turkey's recent history, for example, contrasts dramatically with the flood of Syrian refugees that they are dealing with today. 
a population that is not concentrated only in the working ages and that is moving in order to escape death and persecution rather than just looking for a job. Turkey's exporting of workers starting in the 1960s and then tapering off toward the end of the century was a much calmer, more deliberate, and more calculated, rational sort of population movement based on calculated, rational policy decisions by both the sending and the receiving countries. But Turkey is not just a country of emigration, as the authors point out. As a global crossroads, it is inevitable that there will always be, just as there always has been, another current of population moving into Turkey. It is just as important to recognize and to understand this immigration into Turkey as to understand its experiment with exporting labor for a few decades. Indeed, in the longer run, this may be the more important side of the coin. When we take a careful look at the foreign-born population living in Turkey, we see some very interesting results. Most dramatic, of course, is the fact that one-third of all the foreigners in Turkey come from neighboring Bulgaria. What is the deal with Bulgaria? Why should Bulgarians be moving to Turkey? Could this be some kind of remnant of the collapse of state socialist government in that Balkan country, with people fleeing the Communist Party and an economy riddled with corruption? In fact, the explanation goes back much farther than the 20th century experiment with communism in Eastern Europe. The Ottoman Empire conquered pretty much all of the Balkan region in southeastern Europe during the 1400s and then ruled over it continually for the next four centuries. Eventually, the Russians showed up and helped the Bulgarians expel the last Ottoman overlords toward the end of the 1800s, which is why the Bulgarians still love the Russians so much today. But during those 400 years, we should not be surprised to learn that quite a few Turkish people moved permanently from the present-day territory of Turkey into these new parts of the empire, settled down, owned property, built businesses and homes and mosques and Turkish baths, had families, and became part of the local population. So long as the Ottomans were in charge, this all went along just fine. But when the empire gradually fell apart and the Ottoman rulers went back to Istanbul, these Turkish populations in the Balkans, above all concentrated right next door in Bulgaria, were left on their own. Of course, this was nothing less than an invitation to the local non-Turkish Bulgarian population to take out all the frustrations of 400 years of what they still call the Turkish yoke on those unfortunate Turks who were left behind in the population. They thought up all kinds of revenge, such as forcing people to drop Turkish names and adopt new Slavic-sounding names, restricting the use of the Turkish language and the Islamic religion, and from time to time even kicking some of them out of the country back across the border into Turkey. Turkey, of course, has always felt a deep responsibility for such people and has special programs in place to take care of ethnic Turks who come back in a steady trickle from what is now Bulgaria and other Balkan countries. Sometimes the trickle is barely noticeable, and sometimes it becomes a more important little stream of people. Another third of the immigrants living in Turkey have come from other, even less developed countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and other countries in the Middle East, or even farther afield from African countries through these Middle Eastern neighbors. After all, just as Turkish leaders thought that maybe their own people could profit from some time in Germany and maybe even come back and help out the economy, other countries have looked this way at Turkey since it is already fairly advanced along the path of economic development. But there are other immigrants in Turkey who have moved there from Russia or the UK or even the United States. This kind of movement doesn't seem to follow the same kind of economic logic. Why would people be moving from England or New England, to Turkey. These are not very large population movements, but they obviously need some explanation. The reason turns out to be that these are often second or third generation descendants of original Turkish migrants to these countries, coming home at last for either permanent or temporary stays in the country about which they heard so much when they were growing up. In some cases, they're bringing back a lot of investment capital with them, and so are very welcomed by the Turkish government on economic as well as ethnic grounds. In the end, of course, we can't keep these two visions of Turkey as a country of immigration and also a country of emigration separated from each other. 
Thinking back to its historic location as a continental crossroads, we must realize the obvious, that quite a few of the immigrants into Turkey already have a clear idea in their minds that they also want to become e-migrants out of Turkey without much time spent rattling around inside the country. Turkey forms one stop on the transit lines bridging the populations of three continents, and just as always has been the case, many of these people will tell you that they're just passing through. This may or may not turn out to be the case for some of them, if something interrupts their journey, such as Europe not letting them in, so they may end up as permanent additions to the Turkish population. So it is important to Martin and his co-authors that we keep this larger perspective of long-term population movements in mind as a context when we turn next to evaluate just how the experiment with exporting part of the Turkish labor force turned out in actual practice. Viewing the historical context of migration in which present-day Turkey is embedded, and after exploring the plausible-sounding reasons why Turkish authorities guessed that it might help to export some workers to Germany for a while, we are now in a position to look back at this policy experiment and judge how well it turned out. The question we want to answer is whether or not the labor migration organized by the government helped to stimulate Turkey's economic development. In one sense, of course, we can never know the answer because we can't turn back the clock and rerun the Turkish experiment starting from the same place in world history, but changing that decision to see what might have happened without it. But we can look at what did happen in comparison with what the authorities expected to gain by their decisions. First of all, let's take a look at the most direct aspect of sending workers out to find jobs in another country. The immediate result of this should be that these workers start earning Deutschmarks or dollars or whatever they earn in their foreign paychecks, and then they should start sending home a good chunk of that money to their parents or spouses or children or other family members back in Turkey. And this did indeed start to happen. As the migrant Turkish population in Germany and other countries increased in the late 20th century, the amount of cash pouring back into Turkey also grew along with it. So far, so good. But eventually, the researchers who were following these patterns began to notice an interesting thing. If we look beyond the total amount of money coming back to the country, a consistent finding begins to take shape based on long-term surveys that conducted repeated interviews with specific Turkish workers in their new German homes. People saved substantial amounts out of their paychecks and faithfully sent it straight back home by wire transfer or other means to their families back in Turkey. But this loyal behavior, which is very strong, very strong at first, only goes on for so long. After about eight or ten years, the amount of such remittances starts to drop very quickly, and after about a dozen years, for some reason, the migrant workers mostly stop sending money back home. This means that about 10 or 12 years after the peak migration out of the country, that last wave of migrant workers will begin to cut back the amounts that they're sending home. It doesn't matter how many millions of Turks are living in Germany, it matters more how long they have been there. We can see this very clearly after the end of the 20th century when remittances suddenly drop to very low levels. So unless you can sustain the rate of workers leaving Turkey indefinitely, the remittances coming back apparently are a temporary phenomenon, not a permanent income stream that people can count on back in Turkey. Well, okay, if we have to live with the temporary nature of remittances, maybe at least we can show that while they were coming in, people were better off. Maybe all that cash coming back to Turkey helped people to invest in new businesses, to employ more people, to stimulate economic growth? On the other hand, there's another possible outcome of having more money floating around. If nothing else changes except an increase in the amount of available money, economists shudder because they know what to expect in that situation. After all, the definition of inflation is simply more money chasing the same amount of products and that does appear to fit the Turkish situation quite well. If we compare the trend in the inflation rate in the country with the trend in remittances sent back from Germany, we find a remarkable similarity in the two series. When remittances were rising to substantial levels, inflation also took off and increased steeply, reaching a high plateau for many years shortly before the end of the century. 
As soon as the level of remittances fell back to low levels after the turn of the century, the rate of inflation also dropped like a stone. This strong, long-term correspondence between the two indicators fits the more pessimistic interpretation of what remittances might do. They might just put more money in people's pockets without giving them serious investment opportunities. The result almost certainly would be consumer price inflation. This interpretation is also supported by the findings of Martin and his colleagues, who point out that since the Turkish economy continued to be dominated by the same kind of crony capitalism and kin-based patronage systems that appear in other less developed economies, it was difficult for most people to find any promising investment opportunities for money sent back from Germany by relatives. So instead, the money usually was spent on conspicuous consumption instead of investments importing expensive cars, ironically often a Mercedes from Germany, or building lavish new houses to live in rather than starting a business or employing people in new jobs. So even while the remittances were coming in, they were not having the economic effect that Turkish authorities had hoped for. In this respect, we can conclude pretty clearly that the plan failed. This failure of economic growth from remittances must be counted as strike one against the labor emigration idea. The next stage of possible benefits from exporting these workers was expected to appear when the workers themselves did. They were supposed to learn all kinds of valuable new skills in Germany, and then when they came home again to Turkey, the country would get a new, improved, skilled labor force that would increase productivity and allow new kinds of businesses and industries to get started, taking advantage of those skills. But on this point, as on the question of remittances, things did not turn out the way the Turkish leaders had hoped. In fact, many of the Turkish workers who had moved to Germany decided to stay there, stay there permanently, pursuing their new careers in a more advanced economy and society where education, health care, housing, and other aspects of life were already developed to a level to which Turkey could only aspire for the future. In fact, many of these Turkish workers also sent instructions back to Turkey along with the money they remitted, telling their families to buy train tickets too, and to come and join them in Munich or wherever they had found a new place to live. This actually helps to explain why the remittances tended to taper off after about a decade out of the country. By that time, many workers had brought their families to live with them in Western Europe so they could share their wages and salaries with these families right there and didn't need to send money back to Turkey any longer. So on this point, the original plan for encouraging labor emigration gets a solid strike two against it. The remaining possibility in that original plan was that getting workers out of Turkey would reduce the unemployment problem. Having dependence in the population of children and the elderly was a big enough problem without having to worry about transferring resources from employed workers to other people in the middle of the working ages who had no jobs and so were also dependents themselves. This aspect of the plan did work to some extent because the people who left were indeed selected mostly from those areas and population groups with the lowest employment rates within Turkey. But after a few years, another unanticipated aspect of the unemployment situation emerged. The trouble was that the economies of the different countries in Europe were all fairly strongly linked, so that when there was an economic boom, it usually meant faster growth and more demand for labor in all those countries at once. Similarly, when a recession hit and the demand for labor fell, this also tended to happen across all these countries at the same time. This was bad for Turkey, because when Germany had a particularly strong demand for Turkish workers, this was usually a good economic time when the Turkish economy itself was also doing better and the unemployment problem was less urgent. More workers were leaving, but at a time when this was less important for reducing unemployment. Then later, when things slowed down across the continent, reducing the demand for more workers and raising unemployment rates, that is when Germany had little need for additional Turkish workers. In fact, the German government had a tendency to try to encourage Turkey's workers to go back to Turkey during a recession, when they were no longer needed in Germany. This meant that such additional workers would show up back in Turkey just at the worst moment when the Turkish economy was least able to find places for them. So these flows of migrant labor toward and back from Germany actually had the effect of magnifying the swings in Turkish unemployment from high to low and then back to high levels along with business cycles. 
So when we get to the bottom line, it seems that on all three counts of possible gains from exporting labor, Turkey strikes out. None of the potential benefits of this policy actually materialized over time in the country. This same pattern of results has been noted in other countries from Africa to Southeast Asia. While conclusions like this are probably never ironclad, and there may be exceptions, if you hear people proposing that it might be a good idea to export some workers in order to stimulate economic development, you could probably reply with some confidence that this is a pretty stupid idea and they should just forget it. Three strikes and you're out.